What's up, everybody? I'm Dr. Jordan Taylor, undergraduate exercise science program director and associate teaching professor at the University of Kansas. On today's episode of Fitness Facts, a former student of mine, Rose Cicillo, is here to discuss women's health and fitness. More specifically, we will talk about common diet and exercise myths, mistakes, and barriers that women struggle with when trying to achieve their individual health and fitness goals. Rose earned a Bachelor of Science degree in exercise science from the University of Kansas. She's a personal trainer, body transformation coach, and a former national level figure competitor. Welcome to Fitness Facts, Rose. I'm glad to be here, Dr. Taylor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we sat down a couple days ago and kind of formulated this list of talking points, topics, um, and like I said, this is, these are things that really, and you know, you, you came up with a lot of these cause you deal, you work with primarily women, um, in, in various capacities. Uh, but maybe talk about point number one, as, as we get into these common myths, falsehoods, beliefs, and, and barriers that women really struggle with and prevent them from, uh, really getting more healthy and fit and, you know, kind of changing their lifestyle to a healthier healthier new, new version of themselves. So so maybe talk about point number one. What do, you, what do you got there? Yeah, so I think that a really good place to start is that women, historically, women think that they need to do the most extreme stuff and starve themselves to lose fat and change their body. And ultimately, they just end up running in circles. They might see some initial progress doing that. But you always gain the weight back and it just, it's not sustainable. And that's why women for decades struggle with their weight. Right. It's, it's, it's tough. I, you know, it's a human nature when you start on a new journey, no matter what it is, um, to try to do everything all at once. And, uh, unfortunately for long-term adherence and sustainability, it's very, very difficult. And, I know, I know a couple other things we talked about is like, and I'm sure you explain this to, to your female clients. So yeah, so basal metabolic rate decreases about by about 10% for every 10 pounds of body weight that an individual loses. And just to explain briefly what basal metabolic rate is, that's basically the energy your body expends just to keep the lights on. So if you're just going to lay in, uh, in bed all day just to keep like your kidney filtering blood, your heart beating, the neurons in your brain firing, it's just your basal metabolism. Um, and, and you know, we'll get more into this, but basically as, as you starve yourself, the amount of calories that you expend and that basal metabolic rate and that basal metabolism drops because your body's trying to conserve and hold on because you're kind of your own mm -hmm. worst enemy, really, when you're going on these extreme starvation yeah. diets. And then maybe you can talk about NEAT, so like what that is. I like to put this, to put this into like a simple context. Let's say your basal metabolic rate is 1,500 calories and your total daily energy expenditure, so that's going to be a sum of your basal metabolic rate and the amount of calories that you burn exercising. Um, let's say your TDEE is 2,200, and then you take the five 600-calorie decrease from your NEAT due to calorie restriction, then your new maintenance calories or TDE is 1,500 calories. And that's why women get to a point where they're like, well, I'm eating basically nothing, but I'm not losing weight. This is why. Because you have, you're basically metabolically adapted to mm -hmm. this amount of calories right now. So you're not really in a calorie deficit at this point. It's just your new maintenance calories. And that's what can be really frustrating because you're like, well, I'm, I'm doing all the right things and I'm not, I'm eating in a calorie deficit, but I'm not right. losing weight. So Right. It's like... Yeah, the basal metabolic rate drops, your NEAT, which is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So your body, any calories you expend, like say fidgeting, I use my hands, I talk with my hands a lot, or pacing, maybe you're on the phone pacing like in your office. Yep. <laughs> These are all calories that you expend kind of unconsciously, and that's what makes up the NEAT that Rose was talking about, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And then you also expend calories, obviously, through purposeful exercise mm -hmm. and through uh, what's called the thermo uh, thermic effect of food. So digesting certain foods, um, it, it costs more calories. It's like a tax to digest and absorb that food than others, like specifically protein, which we'll talk about later. That's, that's more costly, and you expend more energies di digesting that protein and absorbing it than, say, like simple sugars. But um, 
Yeah, so, may, so maybe we'll move on to point number two. So, so what do you got for us on point number two? Yeah, that kind of leads us into this. So too much of a calorie deficit and for too long, it's a form of stress on the body. And a lot of people don't see it that way because you, you just don't think about it. So being in a calorie deficit, it is, it's a form of stress on the body. And like any stress, um, it has negative consequences. And it's also a really important point to mention that like there is a big difference between perceived stress and physiological stress. And even though you might not feel stressed, your body can be physiologically stressed. Right. And you look at hormone levels, some of those other changes. Yeah. Well, maybe what are some of the negative consequences that you, you warn women about or you tell them when they get into these severe calorie deficits where they're really physiologically stressed? Like, what do you talk to them about? Yeah, so, I mean, the biggest one is the inability to lose weight. If you're eating in a calorie deficit, if you're eating, most women should, most active women should be crushing 2,000 calories. They should be. If you're eating 12, 1,500 calories and you're not losing weight and you've been doing that for a really long time, then something's going on. And the longer that you do this, the harder and harder it gets because then you're talking about you're messing with hormones and when you're messing with hormones, you're talking about the chemical messengers that literally tell your body to either store fat or burn fat. And it just gets a lot more complicated. It doesn't, it's not as simple anymore as diet and exercise because you have to deal with more advanced things. And I know one thing, like you mentioned hormones, and I can remember when I was a trainer um, before I became a professor and working with women, I know, um, especially like figure competitors and, and women that got their body fat down below, say, 10 or 12%, and they were really under eating because they're trying to lose that last little bit of fat <clears throat> leading into a show. You know, they talk about, well, uh, my menstrual cycle is all screwed up. I'm, I'm literally not menstruating anymore. I have no period. Um, and sometimes if you're, if you're maintaining continuously that extremely low caloric intake, very low body fat percentage over months and years, yeah, you're going to have some fertility issues and your reproductive system basically shuts down. So, you know, about uh, if you're a female, the ovaries are cranking out estradiol. Most of the estrogen that's circulating in your blood is coming from the ovaries. But about a third of the estrogen that you produce is actually formed from your fat cells via the enzyme aromatase, which converts testosterone to estrogen. And that helps kind of fill in the gap and, and keep those estrogen levels normal. But if you've lost all this body fat, you're under eating, you don't have the necessary amount of fat to support a pregnancy. So it's yeah. like, if you're wanting to get pregnant and you're really under eating and your body fat's really low, your body is is in this state where it cannot support growing a fetus and, and sustaining another life. So, because yeah. um, I know I've had that issue in, in talking to women that, um, you know, they're wanting to have a baby. And it's like, well, you, you got to get your body fat percentage back up. It's, it's too low and you're under eating. So your body knows what to do, even if you don't want to do it. Like yeah. It's going to figure out a way to adjust. This is a common occurrence too in women in their late 20s, early 30s that have fertility issues. And unfortunately, it's not really always talked about with their, you know, healthcare professionals that they go to because they just don't make the connection. And that's the really unfortunate part. Yeah. Because, you know, if your physician doesn't know your lifestyle, your dieting history, and all of these things, then you're you're missing a big part of the puzzle. And I think it's important, and I know you do this, you really try to educate women. Um, it's like, they may ask, well, what is like a normal body fat percentage? I mean, 18, 22%, that's, for a college-age female, that's like yeah. right around normal. And, and some will be like, whoa, 22%? It's like, no, that's, that's you're good. Like, that's, that's normal. Um, and then other, talking about hormones, um, and it's great that you mentioned like, perceived stress versus physiological stress, yeah. or there's acute stress, yeah. which is okay. Short-term <laughs> acute stress is fine. Chronic stress, not so much, but we talk about other hormones and how they affect your ability to lose weight. So for instance, cortisol, if you're in a fight or flight situation, um, even you know when you're exercising, that's an acute stress and cortisol levels rise. Um, cortisol promotes um, what's called gluconeogenesis in the liver. So it helps your liver produce more glucose, dump glucose into the bloodstream. Uh, cortisol in the short term, if it's an acute spike, 
can help promote the release of fat from your fat cells. So mm-hmm. most people want that. Um, and then it also, um, if over more over long term, it can promote proteolysis or muscle breakdown, which you don't want. That would be like mm-hmm. chronic stress. If your cortisol is chronically <laughs> elevated, I always give the example in class, and maybe you can remember from my exercise biochem class. Like if you're stranded on an island, you haven't eaten for two or three weeks. It's chronic stress. Your cortisol yeah. is going to be through the roof. Your body's not concerned with preserving muscle mass mm-hmm. or fat at that point. Most people, you don't want to lose muscle. It's trying to increase those cortisol levels to tell the liver, make more glucose, dump that glucose into the blood. That glucose mm-hmm. has got to get to the brain and the vital organs to keep them working to sustain your life. Mm-hmm. So, But then the problem is, is over time, cortisol can impair insulin signaling, which can impair your ability to burn fat. And a lot of people that have chronic stress, they have trouble, they'll have abdominal fat gain. Um, They have these chronically elevated cortisol levels. Like I said, it screws with their their insulin signaling and then they end up having an inability to burn fat and they actually start putting it back on because of these their hormones are just so out of whack. And then the other one I'll mention, the third point is leptin. Yeah, You probably remember talking about this in class. So leptin is interesting because you know, everyone thinks of fat cells as they just store triglyceride. They're these containers for fat. You know, as you gain weight or you gain fat, there's more triglycerides stored and those fat cells increase in size. But fat cells also secrete various, what are called um, adipokines and various hormones that act as messengers in the body. So fat cells, when they're full of triglyceride and, and you're full of energy, your body has plenty of energy stored, they release leptin. And leptin gets into the blood, goes up to the brain, binds to receptors in the hypothalamus, the structure in the brain, and says, hey, look, this person has plenty of energy stored. We're good. We're in an energy surplus. Everything's fine. And it also signals the brain um, that you're satisfied, satiety, right? And that it helps to decrease, like, hunger pains and a a feeling of of needing to eat. What's interesting is as you go on, like, let's say these starvation diets, and you've been Mm -hmm. trying to maintain 1,200 or 1,500 calories Mm -hmm. for months on end, what happens? Well, yeah, your fat cells shrink, you're losing weight, then you kind of hit a plateau. The smaller those fat cells get, the less leptin is kicked out of them. And there's less leptin in the blood, so there's less leptin signaling the brain that less of a leptin signal means you're not feeling as satisfied, you're not feeling full. So now you're going to start craving stuff and be hungry again. Yeah, that's um, and that's a symptom or a sign that a lot of women write off not feeling hungry or going really long um, without eating and maybe just not thinking about food, like that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, Your hunger signals are really important and they can become imbalanced and that is a sign that something is off. It's It's not a good thing to not feel hungry. Like let's talk about semi-glutide or the weight loss pills that doctors are prescribing for a lot of people now. It's a big thing right now. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what that really is. It's a medication for diabetics, first of all, but it's essentially just prescribed to kill your hunger cues. Sure, you're going to lose a bunch of weight, but are you going to take this medication forever? That could go on a whole other tangent. Right. um, Yeah, I just, I don't think people think about that. And and when you're really suppressing... If you, if you suppress, like we talked about, your caloric intake and your appetite too much, yeah, people may see weight go down on the scale and they, they plateau out because, again, your basal metabolic rate is going to drop, your NEAT is going to drop, your body's going to try to find ways to burn less calories mm-hmm. so you can sustain your existence. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of women, you know, as they're losing weight and they see the scale weight going down, it's like, well, what is the composition of this weight? Are you losing fat? Are you losing muscle? And Mm -hmm. we'll talk more about that later. So let's get into what do you got for us for point number three? This also, you know, ties into being in a calorie deficit for too long. Um, As a form of stress, women don't realize that you can't be in a calorie deficit forever. An energy deficit um, is is a form of stress. And it's really important to know that you once the diet is over, that you have to bring your calories back up to your maintenance level or else all sorts of downstream negative consequences happen. And that's something even myself, when I was competing, I didn't realize the importance of that. I tried to live on that, you know, 1200 calorie, probably, I was probably eating like 800 calories at at one point. Um, And I thought that's just, you know, 
that's how I got results. So it only made sense to, you know, that's how you, you have to stay there. How did you even make it through your workouts on such little fuel? I, mean, I, just... I still don't know. <laughs> it's a blur. But um, yeah, it's, it's really important to bring your calories back up. And a lot of people don't know that. And it's such a, like I said, a psychological barrier yeah. where you educate a lot of the women on this, but it's like they have to truly believe and trust what you're saying. Yeah. And they may even know, but knowing what you need to do and actually implementing it and doing it, that's like two different things. And it can be sure. tough to implement those changes. Like I said, it's a big barrier. So... Yeah, uh, like the the diet, when the diet's over, I don't even really like to say the word diet, right, but I don't like when that. you're like finished <laughs> with a, you know, fat loss phase, a cut, you, it's not over. Like you're not done. You have to bring your calories back up and the reverse diet or bringing your calories back up to maintenance, it's honestly the most important part. So, because that's what's going to allow you to continue making progress in the future. If you stay where you're at, then yeah. all of these things that we've been talking about are going to happen. Metabolic adaptation, your, mm -hmm. yeah, and then it just becomes hard. And when you talk about maintenance calories, so like, obviously this is going to tend your maintenance calories on how much activity you do a day, yeah. your age, your sex, you know, a younger individual is going to expend more calories than an older, your body composition. There's so many things that play a role in how many calories you would need to eat today just to maintain mm -hmm. um, your weight. Mm -hmm. um, but what is kind of typical, I'd say, for like the average like female that you work with? Like what, what calorie intake level are you, are you at? I mean, when women come to me, the first thing that we do is we start eating more food. Majority of the clients that I start working with are not going, are, we're not dropping their food off the bat because they've already been eating low calories. Right. So it's really, and it's really hard to say because like your maintenance calories, you know, people talk about macros and maintenance calories and all of these targets, but they're also ever changing. Like right. your maintenance calories today are not going to be the same as your maintenance calories in a year. Uh, and vice versa. Right. Like it's not a set in stone number. It, it changes with the, your habits, um, your environment, how you eat and what you eat, how you train, how much you train, yeah. um, what type of activity do you do. And so that number is always moving. It's complex and things yeah. are not like mutually exclusive. And I know we'll talk more about that like calorie number in a bit. I know that's But that's I can tell up. you, so I don't have an exact number, but I can tell you it's always a lot more than women think because most of the women are shocked at how much more food that they're eating throughout the day and they're actually seeing results. Um, and yeah, so that's... Right. Yeah. Right. Help them put their bodies back in balance is really what it's doing. You're so out of balance. It's like, let's get you balanced again. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to point number four. So what do you got for us here? So I think that a lot of women become way too focused on eating a specific calorie number and they're not very concerned with the quality of the food that they're eating, the quality and the type of food that they're eating. Um, you know, I think most people understand that you have to be in a calorie deficit to lose weight, but what's also really, really important is the food that you're eating, the quality of food that you're eating, because that's going to determine your body composition. Um, sure, you can go into a calorie deficit and eat processed foods all day long, um, but you're if you do that and then you take someone who is eating a diet that is composed of mostly nutrient-dense whole foods that's eating the same number of calories, um, you know, they're, they're going to be very different. They're fueled more appropriately. I yeah. mean, it's just good fuel. It's good. And, and maybe talk about when you're teaching or educating women to make those smart, like healthy food choices, like, what do you recommend? Like, what would be your first recommendation if they're like, what do I eat? You know, like, what do I need to eat, Rose? I think one of the most simple things that you could start doing today is just to start eating more protein. Yeah. Just to start eating more protein. You'll find that you are more satisfied. You are fuller longer. And the second thing would be to eat less processed foods. Yeah. I'm not saying cut all of the cut processed foods out of your diet, but if you start consuming more whole foods and more protein, you'll find yourself wanting those things less. Right. And staying full longer. Like we said, then you go back to the thermic effect of food. Protein is a big molecule. It's a 
greater cost. You actually expend more calories having to digest and absorb protein than you do some other um, macronutrients like carbs and, and fats that are a little more easily digestible and absorbable. And, um, and then plus, you know, obviously if it's one of your female clients and they're resistance training, obviously that protein is going to help some more support muscle growth and recovery. Um, and you know, many other processes in the body. So yeah, adjusting protein first, I yeah. totally, uh, agree with you. And then we, we talked about this other day too. And I, uh, I thought, you know, I, I remember asking you about it, like, um, would you be willing to take like clients on grocery store tours or like some people do not know how to navigate the grocery store. Yeah. Like, where do I shop? What do I get? What, what's good food? What's bad food? I want to fuel my body appropriately, but like, what do I do? Yeah. You know? No, that's, that's a big thing for a lot of women. Um, just fear of the grocery store, maybe because they don't know what choices to make or, you know, it could be a number of things, but yeah, it's important to, first of all, know how to read food labels. Um, and navigate the grocery store. It doesn't have to be scary, I promise you. Um, I understand how it could be though, especially if you have these goals and you don't know where to start and it seems really overwhelming and you you know, hear that you should be eating this and not be eating this and it's just like so much information coming at you um, that you get there or you don't even want to go there. Um, right. It can be really overwhelming, so. And tips, just shop the perimeter your produce, yep. your meats, your eggs, milk, whole foods, right? They're all going to be located around the perimeter of the grocery store. Yep. And then most of your processed stuff, <laughs> stuff that has a lot of sodium, that has a lot of added fillers and sugar, you're going to find that more in those middle aisles. So you're probably doing good if you look in your cart and it's mostly items mm -hmm. from the perimeter of the store. And it's like, you know, you look at an apple, there's no food label. An apple is an apple. It's a whole food. You know, you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you pick up uh, turkey bacon or chicken breast. It's like, that's what it is, right? It's a good whole food source of protein. So yep. generally the less ingredients, probably the healthier it is for you, the less processed. Yep. And it's like, stick to those. Those are going to leave you feeling full, satisfied, and fueled. So you're not only losing body fat that you want to lose, but maintaining muscle and having the energy to get through your workouts, which yeah. a lot of people don't which think about. Really important. Yeah. All right. Um, so point number five, moving on to that. Okay. I'm sure if women are listening to this, they are going to be very familiar with this one. Extreme dieting and cutting out entire food groups is really, really unnecessary. Nah. And the reality is you don't have to cut anything out of your diet. In fact, you shouldn't cut anything out of your diet because let's take carbs, for example, that's a really, really common one. When you are restricting carbohydrate intake, sure, you're going to see weight loss go down on the scale because you're losing water and maybe some muscle mass if you're doing a bunch of cardio in this process. Um, but you're going to see the scale go down. But what people don't realize is that you're restricting nutrients that your body needs. And you're also limiting fiber intake. You are restricting carbs so much to a point that you are missing out on nutrients that your body needs to function at its best. Yeah. And we know, I mean, carbs, especially if you're exercising intensely, you know, weight training, like repeated sprint intervals, um, you know, just a long cardio session, like carbohydrates are your body's main fuel source. It's like gasoline for your muscle cells. So yeah, if you're drastically cutting out those carbs, like you mentioned, um, and we store carbs in the liver and muscle and for every gram of carb carbohydrate you store, you store three grams of water. So yeah, that first week you cut your carbs way down. You're like, Oh my gosh, I lost five or 10 pounds. Well, a lot of that is probably water weight. So you always have to ask yourself, and I'm sure you hammer this home with your clients. Like when you lose weight, what type of weight is it? Is mm -hmm. it muscle? We don't want to lose that. Is it fat? Yeah, that's great. That's what everybody wants. Is it water? And your diet composition, training habits, oh. all of this plays a role in the actual type of weight you're losing. Cause there's yeah. a good weight to lose and bad weight. Um, and that's where... Yeah, and that's, it's just like, if you think about it, fad diets, crash diets, quick fixes, whatever you want to call them, they never lead to sustainable results because of these exact things that we're talking about. Um, and so I really, really encourage women to don't try and cut things out of your diet, but focus on adding more healthy things into your diet because 
that is going to be a lot more sustainable for you right. to do long term. And, and, you know, there's like so many restrictive diets. I mean, there's vegan, there's lacto-ovo vegetarian, where maybe they only eat um, milk and eggs. There's pescatarian, where it's like, okay, it's all vegetables, but we'll eat fish. There's carnivore diet, where it's just like only meat, organ meats, no vegetables. I mean, these are all really extreme examples. Um, and then you have more mixed, like healthy diets. Like I always say, like Mediterranean diet oh. is, is very healthy. It's got yeah. your oils, a lot of olive oil, nuts, you know, fish, um, vet, plenty of vegetables, and, and you get fiber in that. And, but, but generally speaking, for most people, when we're talking long-term sustainability, yeah, long-term adherence, it's like a mixed diet is going to work for most people so you don't have these cravings when you cut out carbs or you cut out no fat, mm -hmm. none of this, none of that. And then you start craving those items and then you overeat, super compensate, you're, you totally undo your progress. So for most people, a mixed diet is going to work. But I don't have any problem. And give me your opinion on this. Like, if a diet works for you, I know faculty, I know people mm -hmm. around KU and, and friends that maybe keto works for them. You know, 75%, sure. 80% of their daily calories are fat. Less than five is carbohydrate. Less than 5% is carbs and the rest is protein. Hey, if that works for you and you can sustain that long term and you're keeping your body weight down and you're at a healthy weight and you feel good mm -hmm. and you feel energetic and you're getting through your workouts, fine, that's great. Do that. But it's like, can you sustain that? Like find something that you can sustain long term because you yeah. see it so many times. People fall off the wagon. Yep. They can't sustain that restrictive pattern of eating. Yeah. And then they're back like Rose, like help me out. Like, you know? I mean, that's what it comes down to. There is no right diet. The right diet is the thing that's going to work for you long term. You have to ask yourself, can I see myself doing this forever? Because yeah. otherwise you're just going to continue going in circles and wasting yeah. your time. Excellent. Excellent points. Yep. All right. Number six. God, this is everybody is like, yeah. yeah. Carbs do not make you fat. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you need carbohydrates to function at your best. They are your body's preferred energy source, like Dr. Taylor mentioned, and we need them. And like I had mentioned, when you're restricting carbohydrates, you're also restricting really important nutrients that your body needs and fiber. And it's just, there's no need for it to lose body fat. You don't have to cut out carbs. If you are listening to this and you're thinking, well, you know, I lost a bunch of weight when I cut out carbs this one time or, you know, so-and-so in the office said that they went no carb and they're doing keto and they lost a bunch of weight. Well, the reality is they lost a bunch of weight because they were in a calorie deficit, but it wasn't the carbohydrates necessarily that they restricted. Yeah. And, you know, the argument I always hear is people will say, well, if I eat a lot of carbs, what happens when you eat carbs and you get glucose entering the bloodstream? Your pancreas releases insulin. Mm -hmm. Insulin is a hormone that shuttles those carbs into your muscle cells and your fat cells and your liver. Insulin is a storage hormone. Being that it's a storage hormone, people will say, well, then I'm going to store fat. And insulin does inhibit an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase in your fat cells. And by blocking that enzyme, it, it does prevent the release of fat from fat cells. But on a high-carb diet that's low-fat, you burn less fat, but you also um, you burn less fat, but you also don't store as much fat. And here's why: because yeah, when insulin shoves that glucose into the fat cells, a very small percentage of it is actually getting stored as fat. There's a very small percentage of carbohydrate that your body actually converts mm -hmm. to fat. So. Yes, insulin is a storage hormone. Insulin, if insulin levels are high, it can inhibit the release of fat from your fat cells. But you really don't convert a lot of the carbs that you eat into fat. Mm -hmm. And if you're eating a low-fat diet with high carb, your body's going to look and say, oh, look, we got all this carbohydrate around. Well, you're going to use that for fuel during the workout. Mm -hmm. Now, if you flip it and eat a high-fat, low-carb diet, your body's always going to adjust based on the macronutrient composition of your diet. So if it's mm -hmm. high-fat, low-carb, like keto then you burn much more fat, but you're also going to be more prone to store more fat. So it's like there's no carb there to use for fuel. There's no gasoline mm -hmm. for the muscle cells, but you're eating a lot of fat. So yes, you're going to run on that fat. You may not even be able to exercise intensely either because, again, it's a whole different metabolic pathway to produce energy from fat than carbs. So although you're burning more fat because that's you don't have carbs to use, you also tend to store more fat. And so basically at the end of the day, 
fat storage is it's a simple equation. It's just if you're in fat balance, the fat stored is going to equal the fat burned. If you burn more fat than you store, well, then you're going to lose fat. So the net storage of fat is just based on energy balance, really. I yeah, mean, that's what it comes down to. It's it's not about not eating carbs. It's not about not eating fats, not high carb, low fat, low fat, high carb. Um, it just comes down to balance and being in a calorie deficit. If you're in a calorie deficit, you're going to lose weight. If you're eating in a calorie surplus, that's how you gain weight. Yeah, I think it's it's easy and it's human nature too, like, we just want this one size fits all, like this is just going to fix it for yeah. me. And there's yeah. so many ways, it's so cliche, but a lot of ways to skin a cat. There's, like I said, if you just create a slight caloric deficit, 250, 500 <laughs> calories a day, just a slight deficit, doesn't have to be extreme. And you stick to that over time. It's like compounding interest. Those That small change in just the amount of calories you're consuming each day is going to lead to big time results. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel better, look better, and it's just healthy for your body overall, like long term. Um, all right, so what do we got? Point number seven. Point number seven. So this is a big one. I think that you have probably heard the term like um, falling off the wagon and starting over on Monday. And I think that a lot of women get trapped in this never ending cycle of they're eating clean during the week. And then when the weekend comes around, they, you know, fall off or they think that because they ate clean all week that they deserve to have the weekend off. And yeah, maybe they did do really great all week, but then they're taking the weekend off and they're actually consuming enough to take them out of a calorie deficit and into a calorie surplus. So you're they're not in a calorie deficit anymore. Yeah, in just two days, you can very much do that. A couple of drinks, some, you know, treat meals, whatever. It's it's not hard to do. Right, yeah, it's like Monday through Friday, you're maintaining that deficit, and then it's a weekend binge time Saturday. And, um, you know, people don't realize, and then you look at like, maybe Saturday they're out, you know, girlfriends having some drinks. It's like there's seven calories per gram of alcohol. So it, it, those, a lot of people overlook the liquid calories yeah, and sure. also, you know, like sauces. I mean, how much for ranch sure. dressing and how many, those are a lot of them very rich source of calories. And, um, you know, they make a big impact the way, the way you eat on, because I know when I used to be a trainer and I would want, I would have, clients keep a food log, like yeah. maybe over five days. Yeah. But I would never just have them do Monday through Friday. I might start it on Wednesday. And it's like, I want to see what you eat Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. And I tell you what, it was like a stark difference, like stark contrast between the weekday eating pattern and then the weekend. And yeah. it's like, so you got to like account for that in their program and their, their planning. Yeah. Because um, it is, it's a big, it's a big deal. It is a big it changes. deal. Okay, so to finish with this point, I always like to tell women that if the plan that you're on makes you feel like you have to deserve the weekend off, then it's never going to work because you don't have to deserve anything when you just allow yourself to have those things and have a plan that works for you. Right. Have that cookie on Wednesday instead of craving it all bad through the, or craving it so bad all through the week and then Saturday hits and you have a big bowl of cookies. Yeah. It's like, give yourself little rewards and treats through the week. Because I think, you know, and people over reward themselves. Yeah. You know, on the weekend, I know I did a, a, another video and I talked about, I gave the example of, like, let's look at a donut, for example, like a medium-sized glazed donut. There's about 300 calories in that. Yeah. And you could easily binge. I mean, I know I don't eat just one donut. Like, I'm going to have several. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe you have two, three donuts, that's 600 to 900 calories right there. But then you're going to have other meals you eat throughout the day. Then you go out, like you said, with the girlfriends at yep. night, eating pizza, having some drinks. It's like totally take yourself out of that caloric deficit that you had that you had been maintaining Monday through Friday. Yep. I mean, it's just, all right. So we'll go on to point number eight. Labeling foods as good and bad or just assigning morality to food in general. Um, this is just basic human psychology. The more you tell yourself that you can't have something, the more you're going to want it. And you have to kind of ask yourself, you know, is the food that you are preparing a good source of fuel? Is it satisfying? Is it keeping you full? Um, I like that you asked those questions. I mean... It the, 
and I hope you do, like you ask them to your clients, like to sit down when they're preparing a meal and literally kind of take inventory of everything and be like, okay, is this, is this going to fuel me for my workouts throughout the day? Is this going to leave me feeling satisfied? Like that's a great, those are two great questions to ask. Like yeah. if everybody just did that when they sat down, yeah. that would help drastically with yeah. them. I think that know. most people probably realize, you know, when they eat crap food, you don't feel the best. Um, and so, yeah, if you just kind of create more awareness around what you're eating you and start to eat more nutritious whole foods um, and also still allow yourself to have those less nutritious foods, then you can drop the morality and just understand that there is no good or bad food. Food is just food. Some is more nutritious and some is less nutritious. Right. Yeah, and it's it's important because and just remember, like a calorie, like we say, yeah, calories are, are calories. Like it's just a measure of the energy content of food. But let's say the source of the calories that you're getting, those sources are not all equal because then you get into the protein, the carbs, the fat. What's the macronutrient ratios? All of that. But that's where you come in and 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 help your clients yep. um, with making the appropriate food choices and basically kind of achieving that balance in their diet. Yeah. So you want to move on to, uh, to number nine? Number nine. So a lot of women try to outrun a poor diet um, and do a bunch of exercise and cardio and not really pay attention to what they're eating. And that's not going to get you anywhere. And... You know, if they're monitoring, do you talk to them about looking like if they're running on a treadmill or a piece of exercise equipment and they come to you and say, Rose, like I, I was on um, the treadmill for 30 minutes today and I burned, I burned 800 this, yeah. calories. Yeah. Like, what do you have to say to that? Yeah. So a, a lot of women will be like, well, I burned, you know, a lot of people are looking at their Apple watch and how many calories that they're burning through exercise. But what they don't understand is that the amount of calories that you burn during exercise matters a lot less than you think. It's really what you're doing outside of intentional exercise that matters way more. Right. So. They always say abs are made in the kitchen, right? It's true. So wanting to shed fat, a lot of that. Um, exercise is a tool, but a more, uh, you know, a, a better way or more efficient way to think about losing fat is is by dietary changes, right? Establishing healthy nutritional habits. Yeah. And exercise is like an adjunct to that. Yeah. Trying to burn all of your calories through exercise is counterproductive at best. Right. Yeah. And it's and like I said, then if you look, and, and you got to understand how these, whether it's that Apple Watch, that Fitbit, whatever smartwatch you're wearing, or even on whatever piece of exercise equipment you're on, whether it's the treadmill, uh, stationary cycle, elliptical, uh, there's air there in estimating the number of calories you're truly expending. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen with smartwatches, it can be off as much as 40 to 80%. Mm -hmm. Like, And so um, just understand, yeah, you're, you're, you're burning calories and it, it can help you kind of track things, but it's not truly accurate. I mean, yeah. really, the, the, if you're going to have the, your caloric expenditure assessed, you have to assess oxygen intake, um, you can do resting metabolic rate assessments. You can have your VO2 max assessed, and you're literally assessing oxygen intake. Because we know for every um, liter of oxygen you consume, you burn five calories. But the way all these machines work, smartwatches, they're, they're taking things like your age, your sex, your height, your weight, um, you know, the speed that you may be running at, your heart rate. Mm -hmm. And this is being put into an equation to predict or estimate what you're burning. But it's not as accurate as some other like laboratory methods like in an exercise phys lab that you would have this assessed. But again, I'm not against it. I'm sure you tell, I'm not like against wearing a smartwatch yeah. or, or tracking it on the treadmill. It's just be conscious that there's, there's some error there. It's not completely accurate. So yeah. And when we're talking about, you know, weight loss and, you know, really making progress towards your goals, you are going to get a lot further putting your energy towards your nutrition than how many calories that you're burning during exercise. Right. And then it's, it's like I said, you know, you could easily, you know, again, this depends weight, age, so many factors, but let's say you run 30 minutes at a moderate pace and maybe you burn only 
maybe around 300 calories. Again, that's equivalent to like one medium glazed donut. So just yeah. think about it. It's easier to change your dietary habits and what you eat yep. than it is, like you said, to outrun or try to out-exercise that poor, poor diet. Another point to that is, you know, I'll have women say, well, you know, I burn so many calories and I get such a good sweat when I do, you know, a boot camp class or a spin class or whatever. And I don't burn as many calories when I'm lifting, but and, you know, they get stuck on that number that, you know, I burn this many calories, so this is better. But what they don't understand is that you are burning more calories at the time, yes. But if you're resistance training, strength training, then you're burning more calories over the long haul than you are if you are just doing cardio. Right. Keep your, it's called EPOC, excess post-oxygen consumption. Yeah. But keep your metabolic rate elevated for several hours. It depends on the study, but... For several hours after an intense training session, your metabolic rate's going to be elevated. Um, other studies say longer. It depends on what study you read. But, um, yeah, there can be extra caloric expenditure um, and extra calorie burning after the workout, especially the more intense it is, which weight training's intense. Intense, Or, yeah. like, sprints, hill runs, things like that. Those are intense training sessions. So, yeah, maybe you don't burn as many during the session because you got to have rest periods. You know, you rest for a couple minutes between sets, then you lift weight and you rest. So it's not like you're doing an hour of continuous low-intensity cycling or running. It's high intensity for a little bit, rest. High intensity for a little bit, rest. So yeah, they'll look at, oh, I didn't burn as many calories. Well, no, but your metabolic rate's going to be elevated. Mm -hmm. After that workout, you're burning some extra calories. You're building time. muscle, so you're going to naturally burn more calories if you have more muscle. Yep. So, so adding yep. that muscle mass is, yeah, again, metabolic changes, metabolic rate changes. Yep. And you mentioned it a little bit, but because we're moving it here into 10, that, um, you, know, you know, talk about this a little bit. You mentioned kind of like, chasing the burn or you've yeah. got to feel a certain way. Yeah. So I think that a lot of women believe that they have to, you know, feel like they are dying to have a good effective workout. And if they don't feel that way, then it wasn't a good workout. You know, they're chasing like intense sweating and the burn and like, sure, those right. things, you know, might be great sometimes, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're having an effective workout. Um, you know, feeling like you always have to be sore. That's also not, yeah, not true. Yeah. It's funny. Cause my daughter just asked me that other day. Like she's been training for oh, several months now. And she's like, dad, like, don't I, don't I need to feel sore after my workout, after a weight training session? And I'm like, well, not now so much because you've been doing it for mm -hmm. consistently for several months. So you're accustomed mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. Now, if I introduce something new that you're unaccustomed to, if it's un training that you're not used to, yeah, then you're probably going to be sore within that next 24 to 48 hours. But yeah. so many people cue on, cue in on, like you said, and it's both women and men. It's like, sure. Oh, I have to be sore. And it's for like, sure. and no, a like, point on soreness. If you're always sore, that's a problem. That means that you're not recovering well. And that's not good. Right. That leads to problems. And that could be tied into those women that you work with that are under eating, not yeah. consuming enough calories. Yeah. And then it leads to other issues too. Uh, immune system is suppressed. Yeah. They probably struggle with, they start calling you like, oh, Rose, I'm, I'm sick again. Yeah. I keep getting colds or the flu or, because again, you need adequate nutrient intake, yeah. protein to keep that immune system yeah. healthy. Plus, we go back to chronic stress. If you're chronically stressed, under eating, body weight's low, and that cortisol level is high, cortisol suppresses your immune system. So you are more likely to be sick. Then that's going to interrupt your training. Yep. Like you can't go, I mean, so it all just, it's this domino effect. It is, yeah, it's it's all connected for sure. All right, number 11, this is a big one. Women <sighs> are scared to lift heavy weights because they think they're going to get too bulky. This is not true. It is very, very far from the truth. It would, it, it's not, it's not possible. We don't have the hormones, first of all, to, um, to get bulky. And if you, you know, a lot of women say that they, their goals are to, you know, get toned and lose oh, body gosh. fat. Yes. Um, <laughs> the word toned, I, I can't really stand, but, um, being toned is having more muscle and having less body fat to reveal that muscle. And that's um, one thing that I talk to women about all the time. I'm like, you can 
diet and, you know, lose body fat, but really it's only going to reveal what's there. And if you haven't really spent the time building muscle, then you're probably not going to have the look that you want because you haven't spent the time building muscle. Right. So that muscle gives you shape. It gives shape to your body. And I know maybe you talk about um, like skinny fat. You know, that word gets thrown around a lot. Yeah. And can you kind of explain like what that is? And maybe maybe you've talked to some of your female clients about yeah. skinny so fat, that term. Most women, you know, they go on this journey of weight loss and they track their calories and they eat low calories and they do a bunch of cardio and they might, you know, be seeing the scale go down and they're thinking, hell yeah, like this, you know, low low calorie, you know, intense cardio program, like it's working. (laughs) And because they see the scale going down, but, um, they just end up skinny fat and never really getting the look that they desire because they didn't spend the time building muscle. Yeah. It's like you could, yeah, the weight's going down, but if we actually assessed your body fat percentage and measured that, it may not have changed much. You Mm. may have lost a ton of water weight and a ton of muscle, which no one wants. Like you want to sustain that, keep that or build it. And Lose the fat. So it's always like, please think about if you're losing weight, what is the composition? What is the type of weight you're losing? It's so important. And I think that women also just kind of being scared to get into the weight room in general, I can really like empathize with that because it can be scary if you're, you know, never worked out before, you know, never been under a barbell um, or you really like have no direction. It can be overwhelming and scary. Um, so I, I totally get that, but you got to get in there and you just have to start. So it's like one of my football coaches used to say, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And it is in another psychological barrier there. It's like, no, you need to go, but you're, you're scared. You're nervous to go. You mm-hmm. think, and actually for the most part, I, I find most people in the gym are pretty welcoming because you got to yeah. remember everyone had a day one. Everyone was starting where you started. Yeah. But you go to the gym and you see, oh, there's that really fit lady or that really fit guy, whoever it is. And, and that didn't just happen. Like that took time. So they started at square one too. And, and most people I find like genuinely, I guess, are pretty nice at the gym. And yeah. I do think one thing when you mentioned don't be scared of the barbell and, and the free weights and, you know, the, the equipment, how machines work, that can all be intimidating. But um, that is one thing where I know we're on the ride over, we we're talking about CrossFit and I have my pros and cons with CrossFit. But I think one thing that CrossFit did do well is it it got women lifting and it got them to not be scared of free weights and a barbell. And Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at some of those CrossFit women and they, they've got muscle, they're fit, they're good looking girls. (laughs) So it's, you know, and I I think most women would agree if they saw that, they'd be like, oh yeah, I'd like to look like that. Well, they weren't scared of a barbell. That's one thing. And building muscle and just getting stronger, it's so much more empowering. Like you feel being strong is empowering. Um, and you just don't get that same sense of satisfaction if you're just doing a bunch of cardio and trying to lose weight. Right. Yeah. You want to be well-rounded, incorporate everything, dietary changes, the cardio, the weights, right. Hit all those different fitness domains, of course, your mobility and flexibility, get all incorporate all that. That's where Rose can come in and help you. (laughs) We'll give her contact info at the end. You can contact her and she'll help Uh. you out. (laughs) So, um, all right, we'll move on to number 12. What do you got there for us? This is a big one. So stop being emotionally tied to the number on the scale. I have this conversation with women weekly because the truth is the body that you're probably seeking is not going to correspond with the number on the scale that you have in mind because if you want to look more toned, for example, you are going to be adding muscle to your frame. And when you're adding muscle to your frame, you are adding weight to your frame. Right. So if you are really stuck on that number on the scale, then it's just going to kind of hinder you. And I think that it can really stop women like in their tracks. I mean, yeah, this also comes to not understanding why the scale fluctuates, for example, like you could be following your plan perfectly. Mm -hmm. And one day you just wake up five pounds heavier and you're like, oh my God, this isn't working. Like, what am I doing? And then what's the immediate reaction? Restrict, like start doing a right. bunch of cardio. But they don't realize that the scale can fluctuate for so many reasons. Right. Um, maybe you ate more carbs. Maybe you're yep. about to be on your period. Maybe you, you know, 
trained really hard, um, just so many things. And so it's not, the scale can just be, it's really hard for women to get past. Like you said, maybe you had a car, several carb heavy meals the day before. We know, like I mentioned earlier, for every gram of carbohydrate that you end up eating and storing as glycogen in your muscles, you store three grams of water. So water weight fluctuation right there. It's like, Hey, you gain weight, a couple pounds, whatever, but what type of weight is it? Also, it's like, when did you weigh yourself? Are you yeah. weighing yourself at different times throughout the day? You're typically going to weigh more in the evening than you are first thing in the morning. That's really important, So too. you can't yeah. just be going off of the scale weight when you're weighing at all different times of the day because it's going to fluctuate. That's another point to mention. Like, I don't, especially with my clients, I'm not watching daily weights. I'm looking at trends over time because that's what's going to give you an accurate depiction of what's going on. Yes, that's a great point, right? Trends over time. Yep. It's kind of like when we talk about research studies when you're in class. It's like, yep. don't just cherry pick or look at one study, look at the weight of the evidence. Yeah. You know, if there's 20 studies on a given topic X and 18 say this and have reached a certain conclusion over here and two have this have this uh, counter narrative, this other conclusion, it's like, well, the most of the weight's over here. So this is probably more believable and more applicable to whatever, huh. you know, the topic X is. But... And yeah, those are great points, looking at trends over time. Trends over time. And another really big one on this topic is if you are somebody who has been dieting for a really long time, if you don't remember the last time you weren't under eating, um, you know, you're probably dealing with, you know, downregulated hormones and, you know, metabolic issues. So it's also possible that you're probably going to need to gain a, a little bit of weight to get where you want to be. Um, and that can be really, really hard for women to accept. Um, she just, just see like alarms going off, gain weight. Like, it's yeah. just like, ah, like your head's like, yeah. woman's head is going to pop it's off. Scary. Like, really? Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess so yeah, I used to tough. give this example to my female clients too. I'd, I'd give them two scenarios. Okay. Let's pick your scenario A and scenario B. Would you rather be, let's say she's I don't know, five foot five. Would you rather be five foot five, a um, hundred and twenty pounds, but at 26 percent body fat, or would you rather be five foot five, a hundred and forty five pounds, and like, you know, fifteen percent body fat, eighteen percent body fat? Well, when you present it that way, it's like, yeah, scenario B, they way more. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But the body fat percentage is lower. It's like, yeah, because you have more muscle, less fat. Most women are going to pick that option. Yeah. Like, I want to go with that. Yeah. So it, it's just so hard. You have to, and I know you do this, it's just like you have to present that picture to get them to buy in and understand. Mm-hmm. When we're talking about gaining weight, it's muscle. It's going to yeah. give you that shape, that tone look. It's, yep. it's different. So it's defining what weight is. All right, so we're moving on to, this is a big one these days. Tell us about number 13. (laughs) So diet culture and social media, they do a really good job at skewing women's perception of what a healthy body looks like and just having realistic expectations um, when it comes to trying to change your body composition. And it kind of leaves women stuck and running in circles. Yeah, and it's... It's sad, and, and we talked about this on the way older, over, like, throughout history, you know, society dictates, like, what the, um, like, what a woman should look like, oh. and it's like, or what's attractive, you know, society deems at different points throughout history, you know, one, it was it was heavier women were deemed attractive, and then I, I think about growing up in, you know, even like, well, I wasn't born in the 70s, but 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, I was born in the 80s. You know, it was like skinny, like really skinny. Mm There's this phase like with Hollywood and you looked at all the actresses where they're like eating nothing and they're real thin, like no muscle mass. Me personally, I don't find that attractive as a guy, like just real thin. Um, It just doesn't look healthy, skin and bones. But that was, you know, Hollywood was pushing that. That was the narrative. Then I will say now, I do think it is healthier. Like a woman having muscle, that's now it seems like society is deeming that as more sexy, more attractive. Yeah. But I know this could flip, you know? And again, going back to social media and yeah. diet culture, it's like it's always changing. What is ideal? And yeah. I feel like, unfortunately, women are constantly trying to chase that ideal. And it's just not yeah. fair 
to any of you women really to be having to constantly chase that. And then, yeah. And I think it started with a lot of women at a really young age, even, um, you know, in 13, 14 years old and they don't like what they see in the mirror. I mean, I can remember when I was that age, um, that's when it starts and it's really sad. And my daughter talks to me about that yeah. in middle school. She's an eighth grader. And it's like the bigger girls are making fun of the skinny girls and the yeah. skinny girls are saying stuff about the bigger and girls. And then like, maybe even um, you grow up with parents who are constantly, you know, calling like maybe your mom, you grew up with someone who was calling themselves fat all the time. Um, that can lead to, you know, more issues. Yeah. And the, the co- child basically develops like a complex because of that. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, so we're, we're going on, we could go on a whole tangent we about could. kids and, oh gosh, you know, kids eat like parents and that, that, that would be a whole nother episode. I always just summarize diet culture and, and media, like they lead you astray for so many reasons um, and they do really good at it because that's what they're designed to do. Um, they're designed to keep you coming back. Um Again and again and again. And to whatever fad yeah. diet it is they're trying to market or promote. It's always there's a, you know, we show you this individual, look at this ideal person, and if you just do this, then yeah. you get this result. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You can lose weight. Um, but they're not, you don't know how to keep it off. And that's why women just run in circles and never really achieve the body that they want. Yeah. Again, I like it. It's like you help define with your women, your female clients, realistic goals. Yeah. Tracking changes over time, developing a plan, yep. both with their nutrition and their exercise program, that and fits. that's going to be sus- attainable and sustainable yep. long term. That fits into their lifestyle because that is what it comes down to. All of my clients are very different. Um, I mean, they have different jobs. Some have families. Some don't. You know, you name it, and. You, you have to find out what works for you um, and you have to be realistic about your lifestyle. And yeah, everyone's plan is different because different experience levels, um, you know, maybe they like to spend their free time different. All of these things matter when it comes to having a plan that works for you. Right. And this is leading nicely into point number 14. So here we're dealing with accountability. Yeah, so I think that a lot of women struggle with accountability when it comes to, you know, diet and exercise or, you know, weight loss goals, whatever it may be. And frankly, I don't blame them. It can be hard to hold yourself accountable when you don't have plans and strategies in place that work for you or maybe when nobody is making changes like this around you as a part of the process. Um, You know, maybe you don't know what to do in, in the gym. That can also be, you know, really difficult and it leads you to, you know, go to the gym and you're like, well, I don't know what to do anyway, so I'm just gonna leave or I'm just gonna, you know, hop on the cardio machine and it gets hard. I'm sure you tell your females, it's like, it's okay to feel overwhelmed. Yeah. Like, I'm so where you come in, it's like, I'm here to help you yeah. so you don't feel overwhelmed, develop a plan, yeah. develop strategies. And, and you made a really good point. That's, that's such a good point about, you know, maybe the woman is married, husband, kids. She's the one that's really wanting to get mm-hmm. healthy, fit, change her lifestyle for the better. Mm-hmm. But the husband, the kids, they're used to this that, other unhealthy way of living. Yeah. And when you don't have people on board with you, oh man, that's it's hard. Tough. That and happens, yeah. She probably feels like, you know, well, now we've got to have like, I want to eat this healthy meal over here, but you yeah. guys want, you know, yeah. the kids want chicken nuggets and mac and cheese with hot dogs in it. Yeah. Like, I want to fuel myself with whole foods. Yeah. Whole fruit, vegetables, good source of protein, some good healthy carbs. Like, and it, that that is such a big barrier within families, within sure. that dynamic. Um, and then the time thing. I think this is another one with accountability that was on my mind earlier. Like, what do you say to a woman when she comes to you like, Rose, maybe she works two jobs. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people work in two jobs now. She's a single, maybe it's a single mom. She's got mm-hmm. kids. Like, I just don't have the time. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you I, say? What do you do? I would say, you know, first of all, it comes down to this. So everybody has the time. Um, it just comes down to your priorities and your values. So I think that women say that they don't have the time because they think that they need to work out six days a week, be in the gym for two hours. And it's like, yeah, of course, nobody has the time for that. Um, But you really do have the time. It's just a matter of, you know, making it a non-negotiable 
part of your day um, and part of your life in making it work for you. Um, and I would say, you know, for someone that's super busy, I mean, you could literally start with two at home, 30 minute body weight workouts. You took the words right out of my twice mouth. Twice a week yeah. and make great progress. Yeah. Um, just a couple times a week. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. You, if you, yeah. 30 Most minutes, of the women that hard, I train, I mean, they're only working out three, four days a week. Yeah. Most of them are working out three days a week yeah. because when you have a plan that is sustainable and you're implementing better strategies, then you don't need to work out six days a week. Yeah. Yeah, like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I know when I was training clients, that was one of the first questions I asked. I was like, let's talk about your time. Yeah. Like, what do you do? What's your job? Tell me about your life, your yeah. lifestyle. And then we're going to fit this in yes. to that. Yeah. Um, so that, again, it's it's a, it's sustainable long term. This becomes a part of your life. Yeah. Like, we can navigate around everything else yep. and then still make this, like you said, a priority. It, you have to make that conscious choice and that decision that... I'm yeah. going to do this. Yeah. Like, and I, I think that is also a big one. I think a lot of people get stuck um, on this journey sometimes because they don't think about, you know, how can I really make this a part of my life in the process? They just see it, you know, as some goal that they're going to, you know, go through and they're going to reach and then like just go back to normal life. And they don't find a way to make it a part of their life in the right. process. You're not just checking a box. It's yeah. a lifestyle change. Yeah. yeah. Um, For sure. Excellent, excellent points. All right, so we're talking about making a choice, lifestyle change. This has to be a conscious decision to incorporate this new way of eating and um, you know the exercise routine and everything into your life. Like, what do you say to women when they're like, Rose, I just, a lot of times, most days, I don't feel like going to the gym. I would say, the first thing that I would say is I would ask them, you know, to really get clear on their why and why they why they want to reach this goal and to really think about the person that they want to become and think about the actions that that person takes every day. And I think it's important to realize that, you know, if we sat here and were led by our emotions and feelings mm -hmm. every day of our life, then 90% of the time we're going to talk ourselves out of doing the things that we know we need to do in order to reach our goals. Yeah. It makes it difficult to accomplish what you ultimately desire yeah. when you're just led around by your feelings. Um, so, and I know another thing is a lot of times, uh, this is another little tangent here that ties in, but you know, people are tired. Like I said, yeah. that if it's that single mom working a couple jobs or she's got kids and she's got, you know, then the weekend comes around, she's trying to play catch up, got to get groceries, got to go do this. There's all this run, run, run. Oh God, now I got to, I got to work out too. Um, I used to always ask clients, I'm like, all right, let's differentiate between are you tired or are you exhausted? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I'm probably tired maybe 80% of the time. I got a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Um, but on those days that I'm tired, I'm still going to work out if it's scheduled, if, if it's my day to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm exhausted, maybe I had three, four hours sleep the other night, I was up late working on stuff, had a bunch of emails come in late, you know, I was out, I don't know, working hard in the yard, whatever I was doing. And that next day, I didn't eat much the day before. I am just completely wiped out and exhausted. I know it's time to take a day off, maybe mm -hmm. a couple days off. Maybe even I need a week off mm -hmm. to like just deload yeah. so I can come back feeling refreshed. And that's okay. But it's just like, don't let every day be your, oh, I'm exhausted today. You have yeah. to really be honest with yourself and do self-inventory and yeah. be like, am I tired or am I exhausted? Because there's a difference. If yeah. you're exhausted, yeah, chill out, take some time off. Get your sleep. Yeah. Get and some if you're, food in you. If you're really not feeling like it, and I've had this conversation with clients before, it's like, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to the gym anyway and just start doing something. If you, after five minutes, still really don't want to be there, then leave. But at least you still made it, made it to the gym. Like you, that was still a part of your routine. Not every day is going to be, you know, your best workout that's, um, a, that's a great point but yeah a lot of times that happens to me on leg days um, yeah i'm like Every you have time. to be mentally prepared i'm like oh gosh i'm gonna i've got a heavy leg day today i got a squat i've got yeah. lunges i've got all this 
it's easy to power through like an arm workout or back workout. But when you're working those big muscle groups and it's like, oh man, I got this leg day. I can remember, and it doesn't happen a lot, but every once in a while, maybe only like once or twice a year, I'll walk in and I'll be like, God, I'll know I had three or four hours of sleep the night before. I've had all this other stuff going on. And I go over and I like look at the squat rack or I look at the weights and I'm like, I'm mentally not prepared for this. I'm yeah. feeling exhausted. And I'll turn around and go home. I literally have driven Some all the way to the gym, like walk in, and I'm like, it's okay, Jordan. It's better to go home, eat a good meal tonight, get yeah. my good solid, I'm usually good with six, but eight hours of sleep, six to eight hours of sleep. I'll feel refreshed tomorrow. Then I can train intensely and really hit my legs like I want to, you know, instead of just trying to, you know, push myself through this exhausted state. Yeah. Um, so all good points. Um, Let's see. Uh, what about also planning for the week? So we, this is still on th- this point here. Um, do you? What about like meal prepping and then things like that? What do you suggest with your with your so these busy women clients that you have? I I think meal prepping is great. I think that it's just planning in general. Like you have to do some sort of planning, or else you're just you're not going to be successful especially if you're a really busy woman woman, and you have a lot of things going on. You're juggling a family, you work a full-time job, you're doing X, Y, Z. You have to have some sort of plan in place. Otherwise, you're just flying by the seat of your pants and, you know, white knuckling it. And it might work for a little while, but eventually it's, you know, going to blow up in your face. Yeah. That's why I used to recommend does. like on weekends or even if it's a Sunday, you know, a lot of people Sundays like a catch up day, work around the house. Maybe, yeah, you, you cook for the week yeah, or maybe just a few days into the week. And then, you know, you've got them in Tupperware containers, you got them ready to go. You can take them with you. You got your lunch and then you don't have to worry about that and think about that while you're running here, running there, trying to work, take care of the kids, all that yeah. during the week. Like you have it all prepared on the weekend. So, so you've got a good start to the week, yeah. right? It takes less of the thought process out of your food for you. When you have things prepared, then you're not, you know, getting home from a long day at work, opening the fridge and like you're starving and you don't really have anything prepared. And so then, you know, maybe you, you know, order something or you just eat whatever and it maybe ends up not being right. very nutritious. And then you feel like shit just about it. Eat. Yeah. yeah. Um, planning, you have to plan. And maybe that doesn't look like meal prepping for the whole entire week for you, but you have to, you have to do some sort of planning. So, right. For sure. Right. And this is where if you're having trouble being accountable and you need an accountability buddy, it's a big contact thing. Contact Rose, it's a big thing. right? You're going to help develop those individual exercise plans, the nutritional yeah. advice. I know you do like periodic check-ins. Yeah. Um, individualized coaching sessions and yeah. assessments. So, it's okay if you're struggling with accountability, that's fine. That's what we have why we have professionals like Rose Ask to help you out. Ask for help. Yes. It's okay. For sure. Humble yourself. It's okay to need help. Um, I think we're to the last point now. So yeah. let's talk about this, this point number 15. Yeah. So all of the things that we've talked about today, it really, this comes down to, you have to find a plan that works for you and make it a lifestyle for you. And yes, there is a point where you're probably going to have to change habits and really fundamentally change a lot of things about your life um, to reach these goals. But it's possible to do. Yeah. And like we talked about, it's like make those small little changes slowly over time. Don't try to build Rome in one day. That's so cliche and do it all at once because you'll fall off. Yep. And then also I think it's little things like we've talked about little psychological barriers and things that often get overlooked. But but some people, there's certain things um, that if you do some self-inventory and looking at yourself that may trigger you to go after certain foods or eat certain things or, you know, some people are stress eaters. They are stressed out fighting with a spouse, fighting with a, you know, boyfriend, whatever. And it's like, all right, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to eat a huge bowl of ice cream where I get, so it's, it's realizing, I think triggers a lot too, if that, if we want to use that word. Yeah. I always tell women before I even, you know, bring them on as a client, we, I ask them just straight up, like, are you willing to go into your beliefs, your emotions and your mindset? Because this journey is a big part of it is mental. Um, if you've ever gone on a diet before, like you, you know, that a big part of it is mental. Um, and if you, you know, struggled with wanting to get to the gym and you just don't feel like working out, that's mental. Um, so yeah, a big part of it is really working on your mindset. 
Yeah. yeah. That's why for a lot of you, if you're interested in exercise science and you come in and sit down with me or an advisor, I like to recommend, yeah, get your major in exercise science, but maybe a minor in psychology because yeah. there is so much, whether it's fitness, you know, you're working as a physical therapist in rehab, yeah. like you really need to be able to empathize, sympathize, see things from the client or patient's perspective mm -hmm. to really be able to help them. I mean, it, it helps if you can do that. And and, and also, think about those psychological barriers. Yeah. And also recognize for yourself, like what self-limiting beliefs do you maybe have that are holding you back from reaching these goals? Because that's a big one. And a lot of people, they just don't have the confidence. They don't believe in themselves. Yeah. Like, it's like, I promise you, like you make these changes slowly over time, yeah. little by little, just like investing putting money into an investment, it's going to, it's compounding interest. These things, it's going to compound over time. It and is. before you know it, I always say like, give it six hard months, you look good. Like you're going to totally change. Give it a year of being consistent. You'll look like a whole new person. Like yeah. you really will. Like after a year, yeah. if you it's just not, stay consistent. It is. It's not about making the most extreme changes going zero to a hundred all at once. It really is just starting with the smallest change. And maybe that's just controlling the next meal. It's controlling what you can control and just letting it snowball and compound over time. That's what leads to really, really big change. And then be okay when you fall off the wagon and you make a mistake, you're yep. on vacation and yep. you're like, oh man, the last few days I've eaten like complete garbage. Yeah. Like that's okay. Just get do it again, a self-check. Like, yep. okay, I, I got to get back on track. Like don't be too hard on yourself. And then, because some people just be like, well, whatever, I'm just, I'm yep. done now. Like yep. I'm just going to go back tomorrow. No, it's, we're all human. No one's perfect. You're going to fall off realize that's okay like yep. and be okay with that like please be okay with it yeah so. so true all right well um can you provide some information about like the services you provide to your clients like you know if, if a woman contacts you what how can you help her yeah so i run an online coaching business where i really help women learn how to make nutrition and fitness a sustainable part of their life. And you can contact me on Facebook or Instagram. It's just Rose Cicillo, very basic, my first and last name. And yeah, reach out to me. If you have questions, I would love to connect and see how I can support you. Um, yeah. And I think you gave an email. So rosecis95 at gmail.com if anybody contacts you by email yeah, too. Yeah, that works Okay, too. either way, I know most people are going to, you know, yeah, Instagram, Facebook, social media, obviously. Instagram, Facebook would be best. Okay, there you have yep. it. Okay, cool. if you have questions for me about the KU Exercise Science Program, you can email me at jtaylor at ku.edu or call 913-897-8516. Thanks for coming in, Rose. Thank you. Hope all of you that watch this enjoy this episode, and we'll see you another time. Cool.